Ladies and gentlemen, today we're kicking off Game Theory's 10th anniversary month. Yes, I am, uh, I am that old. April 18th will officially mark 10 years since the first episode of Game Theory was uploaded. For context, my debut was the same year that everyone fell in love with a Pop-Tart cat flying through space, and Rebecca Black's Friday was the most watched video on YouTube, and yet we still call them the good old days. Anyway, to celebrate the channel being older than dirt, all month long we'll be doing special events, like remastering an old theory or two, giving you a behind-the-scenes look at what it actually takes to do these things in 2021 and capping it all off with a live stream celebration on April 30th to thank you guys for an unreal decade of over analysis. There's also a commemorative 10th anniversary gold foil shirt filled with easter eggs from the past 10 years of episodes if you want to celebrate alongside us. That's available right now below this video and only until the end of the month so if you're interested grab it before it's gone. As for today's episode well it wouldn't be an anniversary of this channel without an episode about FNAF and what better way to cover our longest running series than doing it rewind style. <laughs> oh, that's hot. Not that rewind. I'm talking about editing it in all the styles that we've had across the 10 years of this channel. So without further ado, let's talk about new developments in FNAF in game theory styles through the ages. Hello Internet, welcome to Game Theory, gaming's tangential learning experience. In the past few months, we've gotten a lot of new FNAF content. A gameplay trailer for Security Breach dropped, two new books that I haven't talked about yet, and there was even a bunch of images from the game revealed as part of a charity stream. And sometimes, dear Webiverse, you have ideas, random thoughts that are floating around your head, but not enough to make a full theory out of. Maybe enough for a game hypothesis, perhaps, but not so much for a fully-fledged Theory. So today I'm gonna nab those little theory nuggets hovering around my head and serve them up on a delicious platter for you to munch on. In true Fazbear Frights fashion, I'm gonna present to you three mini theories covering the upcoming security breach, the twists I expect that we'll see in the game, and where the franchise might be headed next. Because I think the information is starting to leak out. With delays in this new game causing it to lag behind, I think other parts of the franchise, especially the books, are starting to surge ahead, and might already be given us clues as to life after the breach. So without any further ado, hop aboard, friendos, because this theory train is about to leave the station. Woo! Woo! <laughs> Theory number one, the Glamrocks are secretly toy animatronics. Recently, my good friend Daco held a 24-hour charity stream benefiting the World Wildlife Fund, which, first off, congratulations to him to reaching his goal. The reason I bring the stream up here, though, is that as Daco crossed different donation milestone goals, he was able to unlock screenshots from the upcoming Security Breach game, which, by the end, amounted to 20 images in total. And while most of them are just better angles of places that we saw in the recent gameplay trailer, there were a few that had details that really stood out. First was confirmation that Bonnie appears to be in the game in the form of Bonnie Bowl. Whether Bonnie is physically in the game or if this is just an easter egg reference is unclear, but it's a huge detail because up to this point, Bonnie has been absent from all the imagery of the Glamrock animatronics, seemingly replaced by the newcomer Montgomery Gator. It had led everyone, myself included, to think that the game was just pulling a sister location where, if you'll remember, Chica was actually absent from the Funtime lineup, replaced by new characters like Baby and Ballora. But nope, Bonnie is here at the Pizza Plex. If not physically, then at the very least from a lore perspective, leaving the only missing face from the core four to be Foxy. And we'll get back to that in a minute. Other interesting shots included a view from what appears to be inside of Montgomery Gator's mouth. And while this certainly could be a walkway to a different part of his Gator Golf section of the restaurant, considering we see decorative heads on the walls and different photos from the stream, the view from inside this mouth just doesn't line up for me. It feels too high up to be a walkway, too closed of a mouth to have humans walking through it like they'd be walking through a golf course. Instead, and admittedly this is a bit of a long shot, could this be an indication that we're actually going to be riding inside of Monty at some point in this game? It might seem outlandish, but it actually fits with what's already been leaked out about this title. In case you weren't aware, Funko Pop leaked out this statue of Security Breach, where we see our character Gregory hiding inside of Glamrock Freddy, indicating that at least one of the animatronics, Freddy himself, will be working alongside us to survive against Vanny the Killer 
Rabbit, so why not the other animatronics too? Looking at the characters side by side, we see that both Freddy and Monty seem to have a similar build and the same flip open chest cavity. And consider this, we're stuck in the pizza plex, meaning that we'll presumably need ways to unlock different sections as the night goes on. Maybe one way to do that is by unlocking new abilities from the animatronics themselves. We see in the gameplay trailer that Monty is able to break through locked chain link fences. Maybe instead of him using that ability to chase us, it's us inside of him using it to access new parts of the park. Kind of like Zelda, except, you know, animatronic murder themed. Like I said, bit of a long shot, but admittedly it'd be a pretty interesting gameplay mechanic that kind of aligns with stuff that we think we know about this new title, so just saying. However, the biggest reveal came with the last picture, where we see a shattered version of Glamrock Chica abandoned in what's labeled the sewer. And while that alone alludes to some darker sections of the game, it's how she's dismantled that I wanted to call attention to. Chica has no beak. And as anyone who's been on this six-year ride alongside me might remember, Chica missing her beak in this series is a big deal. Way back in the days of FNAF 4, Scott went out of his way to draw our attention to Toy Chica missing her beak. So, completely out of nowhere, Scott emailed me saying, Clue, during the minigames in FNAF 4, why would the tiny toy Chica be missing her beak? Oh my gosh, and even in the asset you see Chica's beak lying on the ground. Wow, so many memories coming back from that one. Oh, that was such a cool stream and such a cool day. Anyway, the missing beak is a reference to two things. In FNAF 4, there's a tiny toy Chica with a beak that's lying on the ground, which itself is a reference to way back in FNAF 2, where the new version of Chica at the time, dubbed Toy Chica, would lose her beak when she went on the attack. So to see Glamrock Chica here missing her beak seems to be Scott and Steel Wool suggesting that she is none other than a reskinned version of the toy animatronic dating back to FNAF 2. And while that might seem like a leap in logic, the closer you look, the more this seems to be the case. Look at the similarities in the face shape, eye size, and hair feathers between Toy Chica and Glamrock Chica. Same round head, same slimmer body shape. Heck, if we're truly getting old school with it, let's count fingers and toes, friends. Four fingers and three toes on on Glamrock Chica, just like the four fingers and three toes on Toy Chica, which, mind you, is not the same as every other iteration of Chica. Even the material that she's made out of appears to be the same, that hardened, glossy outer shell that would crack and shatter rather than rip or tear or mold like you see with the other old versions of the animatronics. Want even more proof? Remember how I said that Foxy isn't present in this game yet? Well, you know the only animatronic without a toy version? Foxy. It was true in FNAF 2, no toy Foxy. It was true in the FNAF 4 mini game. Bonnie, Chica, Freddy, but no Foxy. And here again, if these are indeed reskinned toy animatronics, there's no toy Foxy. Follow the missing Foxy, my friends. Follow the Foxy. Now, why would this matter? Well, it actually matters a lot. If you can remember back that far, the toy animatronics are actually meant to be friendlies to children. You don't have to take my word for it. Let's listen to another blast from the past explain it. They've spent a small fortune on these new animatronics. Facial recognition, advanced mobility, they're all tied into some kind of criminal database so they can detect a predator a mile away. Someone may have tampered with their facial recognition systems. The characters have been acting very unusual, almost aggressive towards the staff. They interact with the kids just fine, but when they encounter an adult, they just stare. They interact with kids just fine. The reason they attack us in the game is that we're an adult, a security guard that looks an awful lot like William Afton, but kids are fine. Again, if Security Breach is all about animatronics helping Gregory against the threat of Vanny, this makes perfect perfect lore sense. Gregory is a kid. The toy animatronics are designed to protect kids. Coincidence? I think not. Between the visual similarities, the missing Foxy, and the lore connections, I think that this one might just be a slam dunk. But hey, that's just a theory. My first theory of the day, we've still got two more to cover. Theory number two, Elizabeth Afton is the real villain. Over in Bookland, things are getting weird, which, you know, when it comes to a series where a rotting flesh suit filled with robot spaghetti is normal, is saying a lot. We'll get around to me being impregnated by a video game and giving birth to a baby rabbit in the next mini theory, but first, I wanted to touch on a security breach theory that I've been banging on for about a month now. The fact that we'll need to redeem Vanny the killer for some sort of good ending in this game. I feel like the evidence for this has been pretty convincing thus far. Her being called a reluctant follower in FNAF VR's audio recordings, the fact that in FNAF
FNAF AR, we have a series of emails from a character named Ness, as in Vanessa, Vanny, actively searching for such contradictory terms as help and how to induce compliance in human subjects, indicating Glitch Trap's control over her is not complete and she's trying to escape his grasp. There's more, but I've covered all that in much more detail in a previous theory. Suffice it to say, I feel good about that theory as it applies to security breach, but now we're getting even more evidence from outside of the games, via the most recent Fazbear Frights book, The Cliffs. At this point, we're at book number seven, so you're probably aware at how these things work. Three short horror stories set in various corners of the FNAF universe, followed by an epilogue that continues an ongoing narrative about a creature named the Stitch Wraith, with Scott telling us that details from these stories will give clarity to the lore of the games. So what's new this month? In the latest epilogue, we have a lot of things going on. William Afton, having just spontaneously exploded his body in a previous story, now possesses a bunch of trash and machine parts. He's basically acting like a vacuum, sucking in everything around him to create, no joke, a giant 15-foot tall trash rabbit that the book calls the Afton Amalgamation. And if you think that sounds weird, yes. Now, I am not gonna sit here and say that we will at some point in this series be forced to fight a giant trash bunny possessed by a serial killer. No, the reason I bring Trash Afton up is that what he does in the book seems relevant to our ongoing Vanny theory. Quote again, the problem was that when the trash monster stabbed the detective, it infected him with the spirit of the horrible man who animated it. For sure, Afton's spirit would fill the detective with evil, but what if it did more than that? What if it killed him? Jake had to get the infection out. Afton, at this point in the lore, is just an infection, a virus that needs to be extracted in order to save the host's body, and it can be transferred just by a touch or a small wound. And so yet again, we get even more evidence for innocent people getting Afton infused into their bodies and needing to be cleansed, just like I've been predicting with Vanny this whole time. But there's another reason that I want to talk about this epilogue. Sure, the main action of the story is focused around our heroic detective teaming up with the Stitch Wraith to use the screaming mask of the puppet to destroy the giant Afton trash bunny, which is every bit of fever dream insane as it sounds. But while all of this chaos is going on, there's someone else running around controlling things behind the scenes. Baby. Throughout the battle, we continuously catch short glimpses of a long-necked female animatronic. This, my friends, is Baby. The long neck is actually a callback to book one of the series and her story to be beautiful. Anyway, she fuses up with the Afton amalgamation until they start using the puppet mask against it, at which point she pieces out. And it's only then, after she leaves, that Afton loses. We get confirmation of this in the final sentences of the story. One final quote, the awful man's spirit wasn't as powerful as it had pretended to be. Afton's spirit was barely hanging on to this reality. Something besides Afton had been controlling the trash rabbit, and whatever it was, it was worse. The real threat here wasn't Afton at all, it was Baby. She's the one at the end of the story who escapes to fight another day. She's the one who leaves the cliffhanger. And that, my friends, is weird. Let me explain myself. I think everyone, Scott included based on his Reddit posts, was surprised when Security Breach didn't come out last year. And just like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, when you have an elaborate connected lore, release dates lining up matters a lot. Except for one problem. When the ship is already sailing and there are so many companies and moving pieces and agreements involved, changing launch dates becomes really hard and potentially really expensive. To my knowledge, the book release dates never really shifted despite the game getting delayed. So could this epilogue be a preview of what's coming after Security Breach? Think about it. In the Stitch Wraith story, Afton is doing what we expect him to do in Security Breach. He's acting like a virus infecting someone, in this case Vanny, who then needs to be cleansed. But then Fazbear Frights effectively ends Afton's story. It outright calls him weak. He's defeated by the mask and it sets up Baby to become the ongoing big bad moving forward. What I'm saying is that what if this book was supposed to come after Security Breach had been released? But now, because of the game's delay, we're getting a preview of what it's setting up moving forward. In the trailer for Security Breach, we get this line. There is more going on here than you realize. Maybe there really are some new tricks up this game's sleeve. But what could Baby be working on moving forward? Well, for that, it's time to talk about theory number three. <laughs> Theory number three, the body snatchers. And now it's time for Matt Pat's final thought. Or final theory, I suppose. Man, those were really cringy for those like first couple episodes. Why did I think that was a good idea? Anyway, I'll keep this one a bit shorter since the episode's getting long, but basically at this point, we've got ourselves 21 short stories in Fazbear Frights, and they cover everything from haunted animals to killer dolls to deadly video games. But there's one consistent theme across a shocking number of these stories, body snatching. In book number one, we have To Be Beautiful, where baby 
steals a human girl's body piece by piece so she can take over her identity. In book number two, we have Lonely Freddy, where a boy is lured to the back of a Freddy Fazbear's pizzeria and mind swapped into a Freddy doll so the animatronic AI can go out into the real world posing as him. In book number three, we have Room for One More, where mini Renas shove themselves into a security guard's stomach so they can escape out into the surface world, a very direct parallel to the sister location ending. Book number five has In the Flesh, where, ugh, fine, I'll talk about this one, a male game designer, after a series of events, literally gives birth to a physical form of glitch trap by slicing him out of his own impregnated stomach. And of course, the game designer is named Matt. The guy is also a supreme jerk to everyone else throughout the story, so thanks a lot, Scott. Very subtle. Didn't know you felt that level of hostility toward me. But again, animatronics using humans to escape out into the real world, to become real or outright posing as their identity. And last, but probably most explicitly, is the latest story, He Told Me Everything, in which, and I'm gonna tell you what happens in the story, and you're not gonna believe me, but this is what happens in this story. A cult-like science club experiments using a substance called Fazgoo. The experiment involves the students pulling out one of their own teeth and feeding it to the goo, which then connects a gooey tendril to their finger. We eventually learn that the goo is draining the students' organs and bones in order to grow into a perfect clone of the original host. It is odd, and it really feels like it's pushing the limits of what can and can't exist in the FNAF universe. Now, could all of this just be recycling the same ideas for horror stories in a series that now has an enormous number of installments and is in constant need of new content? Absolutely. But it is the strongest recurring theme in the book series, and one that, when coupled with the Afton infection concept, seems like it could very well be the next logical step for the games. Think of it like prop hunt for FNAF. Who's real and who isn't? You don't know, you gotta figure it out. We've exhausted what one killer can do, so why not an army of killers? Besides, animatronics posing as real people is already something that Sister Location opened the door to, so if you have the ability to infect the masses, that's a new direction to take things, I guess. I'm just saying, we've had bad animatronics, looks like we'll have good animatronics, we've had people stuffed inside animatronics, we've had animatronics stuffed inside people. Now in the books, we're on a regular basis having animatronics turning into people, so why not an army of AIs inhabiting flesh-stolen suits? And if I'm Right, and Baby is indeed filling the villain role for the series moving forward, seems like the sort of thing that she'd totally be into. Skin suits helped her escape sister location. She is literally able to be a body double for the protagonist Charlie in the original novel series. She's not a killer like her dad, she's a copier. A girl who's upset about dying young and losing her humanity early. So why not try to regain it back while creating an army of body snatchers to come along with ya? But hey, that's just a theory. Three game theories. Thanks for watching for 10 years, guys. By the way, theorists, if you're worried about some creepy animatronic possessing you through your screen, then you'll really love our sponsor for today's episode, NordVPN. With Nord, you can rest easy knowing that no reanimated Lapin themed serial killer is gonna steal your identity because Nord is keeping your information safe behind a wall of next generation encryption. Not only that, but Nord has a strict no log policy, meaning that your data is never being stored or saved anywhere anywhere that you don't want it. In fact, if anything, Nord makes you into the god of the interwebs, shattering the global barriers that prevent you from seeing your favorite content. For instance, one of my favorite YouTubers is Derek from Veritasium. He was recently on the British show QI, which is available on Netflix in the UK, not doing me a lot of good here in the States. But with Nord, in one click, my internet appears like it's in jolly old England, and I can see my friend doing his Across the Pond cameo. It is that easy, my friends. Same thing with RuPaul's Drag Race UK Season 2, which is fantastic, by the way. I struggled to find it here in the U.S. until I hopped across the pond with the help of Nord and binged the whole season in one go. I am a hardcore Bimini Bon Boulash and Lawrence Cheney stan. Today, NordVPN is offering you theorists a special deal. You can get a huge discount on a two-year plan plus an extra month for free by going to nordvpn.com slash matpat, M-A-T-P-A-T, -A -T, and then using the code matpat at checkout. And it's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. So go to nordvpn.com slash matpat, use the code matpat to get that deal, or just click the link in the top line of the description below. And in the meantime, I'll see you all next week for another special anniversary episode.